In September of 2014, only one month after the release of Five Nights at Freddy's, Scott Cawthon, the creator of the game, would post a teaser onto his website. A picture of what appears to be a slightly older version of Freddy with noticeable tears. The text grand reopening and the number two can be seen, as well as a date of 2015. This was a teaser of what would eventually become Five Nights at Freddy's 2. A couple days later, a new teaser would be released. Something borrowed, something new. We can see what appears to be an older Bonnie, notably with his face ripped off, and next to him a newer Bonnie with brighter colors and a much more polished appearance. A third teaser would be posted once again. On the left, we see Foxy peeking through the curtains, and on the right, we see a new pink-colored fox character peeking on the other side. Something interesting is that Foxy in this picture doesn't appear to have a different design despite both Bonnie and Freddy having different designs in the last two teasers. Instead, the model used is that of his FNAF 1 appearance. It's possible that Scott hadn't created a new model for Foxy yet, so he just used the first game's model for this teaser. The next teaser would soon follow, showing what appears to be the inside of Freddy's head, as well as a flashlight shining through the hallway, showing the new Foxy design. The first game's Foxy already looked worn out, but this Foxy appears to have his wear taken up a notch. On October 21st, a bombshell will be dropped onto the FNAF community. A new trailer for the second FNAF game. Minus the strange aspect ratio of the trailer, trust me this isn't the last time I'll mention aspect ratios, the trailer is pretty good at showing off the game, at least better than the first one. We open on Withered Bonnie, sitting in the hallway, as his glowing red eyes light up. A rendition of London Bridge is playing with a bunch of little kids singing. The trailer is really good at setting up hype around the game, showing the parts in service, the old characters with these really creepy shots of the models. I know this is just me, but something funny I see whenever looking at Freddy is that his nose is placed right up in front of his eye, which makes it look like he's twitching or in the middle of blinking. Obviously that's not what's happening, it's just a weird little perspective thing, but still. We then see this animation of the new Bonnie shown in the teaser, who somehow opens his eyes with only two frames. Finally, we get to see some gameplay, which is for some reason a different aspect ratio to the rest of the video. And then we get the final text showing Five Nights at Freddy's 2 before the trailer ends. I'm gonna be honest, this trailer is way better than the FNAF 1 trailer. It actually helps build up tension and hype around the game, showing all these creepy models, some gameplay, and even Freddy's twitching eye. Compare this to the first one, which does build up some tension, but the repetitive sound really breaks up the tension. After the trailer was released, a fifth and final teaser would be released. A black screen with a button and a warning symbol. Nothing really important on the surface, but upon brightening the image, this creepy animatronic is shown with what appears to be some kind of crying mask. It's probably nothing important. Imagine being a fan at this time, having to wait until 2015 to play this game, only for the game to release like three months after the first game. Yeah, FNAF 2 was released way earlier than it should have been. Although this may have been seen as a plus to the fans who were able to experience the game earlier, when taking a closer look at the game itself, you begin to realize that the game is actually quite rushed and unpolished, containing many flawed mechanics, some strange decisions and leaps in logic, and some downright unfair moments. This is a kind of obsessive review of FNAF 2. Now, I'm not going to take credit for this video concept because I didn't come up with it. It's actually a video idea by Kaiser, who made a really great video on the flaws of FNAF 1. Think of this video as an unofficial sequel to that video. I'm sure Kaiser's going to make a video about FNAF 2 similar to this one, so uh, watch that when it comes out because it'll probably go more in depth compared to this video. I'll also try to keep lore related discussions to a minimum when discussing the game. Honestly, the lore is really confusing, extremely contrived, and convoluted, and I am way too unqualified to talk about it here. At most, I'll make a passing comment about it here or there if the lore relates to a game mechanic or point of criticism I bring up, but don't expect a full lore review or breakdown. I think it's best to leave that up to Magic Patrick. But enough of that, let's actually open FNAF 2 and see what this game has to offer. When we first open the game, we're met with a cutscene that has lore? This appears to be from the perspective of Freddy in the FNAF 1 location. The player can pan over to see Chica on the left and Bonnie on the right. The screen begins glitching, and some text saying error is seen at the top left corner. I couldn't tell you for the life of me what these cutscenes mean, but I'm sure the theory crafters had a lot to chew on when they saw this for the first time. After the cutscene finishes, we're met with a pretty cool looking menu. We see the new toy animatronics that twitch into the older withered animatronics, making this really cool effect. 
This is probably the creepiest the toy animatronics look, being in a dark light giving them a more sinister vibe. It's much better than their appearance in the game itself, but that's a topic for later in the video. Besides the cool visuals, the title screen is pretty bare bones, only containing a new games button and a continue button. Would it really hurt to add a settings menu or something, perhaps with an option to unstretch the game? Oh yeah, the game is stretched. If your monitor is in a ratio other than 4x3, which most monitors these days are, the game will automatically stretch itself to fit the aspect ratio. I have no idea why Scott decided it was a good idea to make the game in 4x3 since most computers in 2014, the year the game released, were in 16x9. And the first game was also in 16x9, making this decision to make the game in 4x3 even more confusing. This makes the game look really cheap and ugly, so whenever I play the game, I have to go into my settings and change my screen resolution to one that's a 4x3 aspect ratio. I don't understand why this game was made in 4x3 when it was clearly possible to make it in 16x9 as seen with FNAF 1. One fix to this problem that doesn't require remaking the graphics from the ground up is to just make the game resize automatically when opening the game. This is actually what happens in FNAF 1 where the game itself resizes to fit the lower resolution of that game. A similar thing could have been done in FNAF 2 where the game automatically resizes to a resolution that's in 4x3. It's much easier than going into the settings, changing the screen size with this very annoying pop that appears every time you change the screen size, and then having to go back and change it once you're done playing. Frankly, I could rant all day about aspect ratios of this 10 year old game, but while ranting, my mouse accidentally hit the new game button, so I guess we're gonna start night one now. When first starting the night, you're greeted to a pretty open office, which is a stark contrast to the more cramped office in the first game. A lot of the basic mechanics in this game can be gathered from simply clicking around and seeing what the different buttons do, as well as this helpful message on the corner of your screen which might be helpful. Eventually, you should find out that clicking the light buttons on the vent will, well, turn the lights on. I guess your character somehow stretches their arm all the way to the light button because it looks pretty far from where you're sitting. If the player flicks their cursor down on the right button, they can activate the camera, similar to the first game. When looking in the cameras, you might find this mysterious music box, how spooky. When the control key is pressed, a flashlight will flash the hallway. When in the cameras, the flashlight can flash whatever camera you're on. Next to the camera button is a button to put the Freddy mask on, which is a mechanic that will definitely be used sparingly and not get used to ward off 90% of the animatronics in the game. And some players that are looking really closely may find out what happens when you click the Freddy nose on the poster. What doesn't make sense is why the player can't flash the light or go into the camera while the mask is on. I mean, yeah, the security card could just be using his hands to hold the mask, but isn't the mask just the top part of the Freddy head, which can clearly be worn as a mask without needing to be held up? Maybe the security guard just gets scared whenever he puts the mask on and he can't do anything while it's on. Or maybe the weight of the mask is crushing a certain part of his brain, causing him to temporarily lose basic functions like using a flashlight or camera. Or maybe, and hear me out on this one, it's like that because the game would be too easy if it wasn't. Anyway, for the first two hours of the night, nothing happens. Most of the animatronics are disabled, and even the music box doesn't wind down. Something similar was also done in the first game, and since most new players probably won't know that the animatronics are disabled, it makes for a pretty good way to get used to the game mechanics while still building up some tension through the ambience and lighting. For some reason, there are just a bunch of monitors on the ground. Nobody in the community ever seems to acknowledge them, but I just thought it was kind of weird that they were placed there like that. I mean, if you were supposed to be the night guard looking at the cameras, why are they so far away from your desk? In the first game, the monitors were on your desk, which makes more sense, but here they're just on the ground for some reason. They don't even work as monitors since the desk covers the screens of them, and the monitor you're using isn't the one on the floor, so they're just there for aesthetics, I guess. Another issue I have regarding the office is the lighting on the desk, which is blue for some reason? The light on the top of your office is clearly emitting a yellow light, and yet the desk seems to be lit by a blue light, making it look out of place compared to the rest of the office. This isn't a huge deal as it's probably just some kind of technical limitations Scott had to deal with, but it's just something I noticed. Also, what's up with the vents? If we look at the cameras, we can see that for some reason, the only two vents that are mapped out are the ones that lead straight into the office. Obviously from a gameplay perspective, this is meant to show that the vents have some significance in the gameplay, but from a practical standpoint, it doesn't make that much sense. Like, are there more vents? Are these the only two vents in the entire building? Surely there are more in order to keep the building from heating up. If so, why are these the only ones mapped out? Also, why are they completely open? Shouldn't there at least be some kind of cover on them to make sure nobody gets in there? 
I would also like to point out that the vents are connected to the party room, so what if some kid decides to crawl in the vents because kids are dumb and do dumb things like that? This seems like such a huge oversight, just having these massive vents out in the open. Now, I understand that from a gameplay standpoint, the vents are there as a way for the animatronics to get into your office. That's all fine and well, but there should at least be some kind of explanation as to why the vents are just open like that. Maybe there's some kind of airflow issue, or the animatronics broke the vent covers in order to get in. Just something to help explain why the vents are the way they are. Just like what Kaiser said in his original video, there should be some kind of explanation for why certain gameplay aspects are the way they are, instead of having the player come up with their own explanation. Another strange part of the office is that there's no doors in the office, there's just this massive opening that leads into this long hallway. I guess it's better than the FNAF 1 hallway, which just had two long hallways that led to the office for some reason. But even then, why put the office at the end of the hallway? Wouldn't it make more sense to put it somewhere a little more empty? Like, what if some kid decides to wander into the office and potentially break something like, oh, I don't know, the stacks of monitors on the side of the office for some reason? Now, I understand that the hallway is there to make it harder for the player to defend against the animatronics. It's meant to build tension with the player, as now the player is left out in the open where anything can easily attack. But at least make it make sense. Maybe Phone Guy, a character who's meant to give exposition on certain mechanics and story beats, can say something about how the door isn't there to prevent the room from heating up, or that there's a door there because it just stays open during the night for the guard to easily escape in case something goes wrong. Just some explanation like that, but it's not there for some reason. One thing I can give credit for is the map itself. Minus the vents in the hallway, which I've already explained, it's honestly pretty good. I mean, pretty much everything you'd want in a pizzeria is here. A main area, a stage, party rooms for reservations, a parts and service for, well, parts and service, a price corner for an arcade that's seemingly out of camera view, and a kitchen. Okay, wait. Where's the kitchen? Yeah, for some reason there isn't a kitchen on this map. Perhaps it's just hidden from the map, similar to the locked off safe room in FNAF 1, but an explanation as to why a kitchen is absent is never given. So it was most likely another oversight by Sky, which just goes to show how rushed the game was. Again, just like the vents or hallway, you could not maybe come up with an explanation as to why there's no kitchen. Maybe the kitchen camera is broken, maybe they outsourced their pizza to cut down on costs. I mean, Fazbear Entertainment does seem quite short on money, so it wouldn't be out of the question. Any explanation could work, but since none is given, the community is left speculating. Now, just like in the first game, this game also has the phone calls from Phone Guy, except Phone guy died in the last game, and yet he's back here. It's almost like this is game's a prequel or something. Was that the Most of the first night's phone call is just him explaining some lore stuff. Phone guy also explains the Freddy head mechanic and the music box, two things which will definitely not get overused in the later nights. One flaw with the last game that carries over to this is the fact that the robots are way too advanced for the time. Phone guy says that they're able to walk around, which just shouldn't be possible considering how bulky the animatronics are, mixed with the fact that they're walking on their two feet of all things. Don't you think they would fall over because of this? You're probably thinking that the animatronics are haunted, so of course they can't walk. But Phone Guy implies that they could walk around even before they were haunted, meaning that either in the FNAF universe, robots are just more advanced compared to our universe, or it was an oversight by Scott. Phone Guy also brings up facial recognition, which they use to detect criminals. I don't think it's a good idea to use facial recognition software from the 80s to detect criminals, it just feels like it would lead to an innocent person getting hurt. Perhaps like a bite of some kind. Another thing Phone Guy mentions is the flashlight, which can run out of battery. Uh, but hey, you have a light, and even though your flashlight can run out of power, the building cannot. So don't worry about the place going dark. My question is why Phone Guy would mention the building going dark. Obviously, in the context of the games, the first game had the power limit, so the voice line was thrown in to reassure the player that the same thing wouldn't happen in the second game. But in the context of the story, why would Phone Guy mention something like that? I would hope the building wouldn't run out of battery. Obviously this is more of a problem with the first game having the contrived mechanic of the power running out, but in the context of the game's world, it just seems like kind of redundant information to give. A similar line was said earlier by Phone Guy that also references the first game. Uh, something else worth mentioning is kind of the quirky modern design of the building. You may have noticed there are no doors for you to close. <laughs> but in this case it makes sense because the security guard would probably wonder why there are no doors. It's something the guard would probably have a question about, unlike the power running out, which is just something that wouldn't realistically happen. One way to fix this redundant voice line would be to add a voice line about the previous location's tendency to run out of power due to faulty wiring or something along those lines. Just something to give context to the line about the power running out, rather than just leaving it without any context. But besides that, there's nothing more to really say about the phone calls. We can finally talk about the actual gameplay itself. 
As stated earlier, the first two hours are just nothing, so there's not much we can really do. Once that actually gets going, that's where the animatronics start moving. Just like in the first game, here you could also use the cameras to keep track of where each animatronic is. And since the night is pretty slow and the music box doesn't run out too fast, you can look around and see all these cool camera angles like the show stage or the parts in service. One thing I'll give credit for is that Scott's really good at making creepy models for his buildings. Some of the 3D models definitely look kinda amateurish, but I think it helps in adding the creepiness as it gives things an uncanny valley vibe, even if unintentional. The only animatronics active this night are Toy Freddy, Toy Bonnie, and Toy Chica, and let's be real, these guys aren't scary. They all look way too childish to be seen as scary. I mean, sometimes in the cameras they can look kinda creepy. Like this one of Toy Bonnie staring directly at the camera, which can definitely catch people off guard the first time. Toy Chica without her beak is also a bit creepy, as well as Toy Freddy's black eyes at the office. But for the most part, these guys aren't scary. The thing about the first game is that it was able to strike a great balance between creepy while still being kid friendly, and you just don't get that with the toys. They seem to sway a bit more towards the kid friendly side rather than the creepy side, which in turn makes them less scary, obviously. At most, this night you'll probably encounter at least one Toy Bonnie or Toy Chica attack, and rarely a Toy Freddy attack. Whenever Toy Bonnie or Toy Chica gets close to entering the vents, or when Toy Freddy enters the hallway, the infamous ambience noise starts playing, which can be useful in helping players figure out when an animatronic's getting closer. Now, Toy Chica is what I like to call a vent animatronic. The way vent animatronics work is by crawling into either the left or the right vent, depending on the animatronic. In this case, Toy Chica goes in through the left vent. Whenever an animatronic's in the vent, a sound cue begins playing that lets the player know when someone's in the vents. The player has to use the vent blind spot using the light and then put the Freddy mask when they see anyone in it. After hearing a second vent noise, the animatronics left the vent and it's safe to take off the mask. The vent animatronics are guaranteed to leave after 5 seconds with the mask on, but they have a chance to leave early, meaning that you don't have to keep the mask on for as long if you're lucky enough. If the player doesn't put the mask on, and the animatronic is still in the vent blind spot, when you pull up the camera, they'll jump scare you. Toy Freddy works a little bit different from Toy Chica, he's what I like to call an office animatronic, meaning he plays a blackout animation whenever he gets in your office. Note that all office animatronics don't show up in the vent lights, with one exception who we'll get to after Toy Freddy. The way Toy Freddy works in particular is by first entering the hallway. He starts far away, but slowly gets closer to your office. Eventually, when you put the camera down, Toy Freddy will be in your office, starting his black eye animation. When this happens, you'll have to quickly put down the mask and wait out the animation. If you're not fast enough, you'll get jump scared. Toy Bonnie works slightly different, being a hybrid of the vent and office animatronics. When you see him in the office, you put the mask on, similar to the vent animatronics. After you put the mask on, he'll enter your office, accompanied by a black eye animation with him gliding across the screen. Once this animation is finished, you can safely take off the mask. If you don't put the mask on while Toy Bonnie's in the vents and you flip up the cameras, he'll jump scare you. The way Toy Bonnie works would be fine and all, but the problem lies in that he has a random chance of entering your office with each second of the mask being on, which can lead to issues. But we'll discuss that later. For now, he's not that much of a problem. The mask mechanic works fine as it's introduced pretty well here, but this got me wondering. So, the mask is meant to fool the animatronics into thinking you're an animatronic, right? This works fine with the office animatronics as you have to put the mask on quickly or else they won't get fooled and they'll kill you. But for some reason, the vent animatronics don't abide by the same logic. You can keep the mask on for as long as you want as as long as you don't open the cameras, they won't get you. This doesn't really make sense. Wouldn't the vent animatronics also realize you're just the security guard if you don't put the mask on fast enough? I mean, when in the vents, they're literally staring directly at you. They can see that you aren't an animatronic and yet putting on the mask still works on them? Should there be some sort of time limit for the vent animatronics where if you keep the mask off when they're in the vents for too long, they won't be fooled and then jump scare you? They already do that when you flip up the cameras, so do the vent animatronics not realize you're a security guard until you flip up the cameras? This is one of the many things in the game that don't make any sense. Another thing to mention is the music box in the prize corner. When not being wound up, the music box slowly depletes. The player simply has to click on this little button to wind it up. If the player fails to wind up the music box and it depletes fully, the puppet is released. And after that, it's pretty much game over. Each night, the music box depletes faster, but on this night, it's pretty low maintenance, making it not that much of a problem. But yeah, the first night is really easy. There's barely anything happening, and it basically just acts as a tutorial night, which is to be expected. Anyway, on to night two... Okay, um... Why is the text inconsistent on the 6am screen? 
the seven second display, which the end screen is trying to emulate, is for some reason inconsistent. If we draw all seven segments on this five and then overlay them over the six, we can see that this area on the left doesn't quite match up, which shouldn't happen since the whole point of a seven second display is that all the segments stay the same no matter what number is being displayed. I know this is completely insignificant and doesn't matter at all, but it's something that's been annoying me ever since I noticed it, and I want you to suffer with me. Also, the distance between the segments on the A and the M are uneven, which is only made worse if you play the game stretch like most people do. Anyway, now on to night two. For some reason, there's no cutscene between night one and two. Just thought it was a bit odd considering the rest of the nights had cutscenes in between them. I'm not complaining though, since when replaying the games, the cutscenes were always the most boring part anyway. Night 2 is pretty similar to Night 1, only slightly harder. Similar to Night 1, in the first hour the animatronics are all disabled, but this time you need to wind the music box as it begins depleting right as the night begins. At this point in the game, the music box is still pretty low maintenance, going at the same speed as it did the first night, so keeping track of the animatronics and the cameras is still pretty manageable without letting the box run out. In this night, we get introduced to three new characters, Foxy, Balloon Boy, and Mangle. When it comes to Foxy's design, I think it's pretty good for the most part. Sometimes he can look really creepy, especially when he's in the hallway or in the parts and servers, but other times, like on the custom night menu, he just looks kind of goofy. But most of the time, he still gives off that creepy vibe, which was missing from the toys. Balloon Boy's design is also pretty creepy, with his fixed smile and his eyes that stare deep into your soul. His humanoid design helps him stand apart from the rest of the animatronics, and these human character traits make him look more uncanny as well. Mangle's design is pretty unnerving too, just being a mangled, pun intended, mess of parts. Some of his renders in the camera also look pretty unsettling, minus the bad compositing job, which I'll get to later. And I really love the surrender of her with Foxy in the hallway. Now, when it comes to their mechanics, Balloon Boy and Mangle are just vent animatronics, so they work pretty similar to Toy Chica, just with some minor differences. Just like Toy Chica, they enter through either the left or right vent, but the difference being that each one has its own unique sound cue. For Balloon Boy, he enters through the left vent, and he makes a laughing noise every time it moves. <laughs> Hi. This is actually pretty helpful as it allows you to keep track of him if you understand his movement patterns. For some reason, he doesn't appear in any camera except the game area and the left vent. I guess Scott just forgot to add sprites for BB in different locations, so he just kind of looks like he just teleported into the vents. Also, for some reason, he doesn't trigger the ambience noise when he's near you. Maybe it's just because he can't directly kill you, but it's still strange nonetheless. Once BB enters the vent, you fend him off by putting the mask on, which I already explained earlier. The difference is that instead of jump scaring you, when you flip up the cameras without using the mask, he'll enter your office and disable your flashlight and vent lights, which is basically game over for reasons I'll discuss soon. There's no reason given as to how Balloon Boy is able to disable your flashlight. I mean, it's not like he stole it or anything, you can clearly see it's not in any of his hands. Who knows, maybe Balloon Boy is just a powerful being with the ability to affect the essence of light or something. As for Mangle, he appears in the right vent, and when he's in the vent blind spot, he plays some radio static noise. which makes it really easy to know when he's in the vents without using the vent lights. You fend her off by putting the mask on, as you would expect, but the difference here with her is that flipping the cameras won't result in an instant game over. Instead, he'll stay on the ceiling of your office, playing this really loud static noise. Now, it's simply a matter of luck. Every time you flip the cameras down, he has a chance of jump scaring you. So if you're lucky, she could just stay in your office for the entire night, although it's just safer to keep her out altogether. Something kind of dumb is how Mangle is able to get onto the ceiling in the first place. Like, is he Spider-Man where he could just climb onto walls? Does he have super glue on his hands in order to climb to the ceiling? I can only assume the animatronic parts are way too heavy for her to stand up and yet somehow she's able to do it for as long as she wants. But then again, why am I even questioning this? We already have bulky animatronics that are able to walk around freely with no issue somehow, so sure, why not have gravity-defying robots that just hang on your ceiling? Also, Mangle just looks like a PNG pasted onto the existing office sprite. Just like the office desk and fan, the light source of Mangle appears more blue than the yellow coming from the office light. In fact, a lot of the images of Mangle in the cameras look like she just pasted into an already existing image. When you flash the flashlight in the cameras, most of the other animatronic shadow reacts to the light, but for some reason Mangle's doesn't. Most of the time, the light just looks like it's coming from a completely different source on Mangle compared to the rest of the image. 
I can only assume this was done because Scott rushed the game and didn't have time to create renders of Mangle blending in with the camera locations, so this is the best he could do. But it just comes off as jarring and really takes you out of the whole experience. Speaking of cameras, something funny I noticed was that the static in the camera seems to have the same perspective effect as when you're in the office. You see, in most of the games, there's this perspective effect that's meant to give the illusion of movement. If you were to turn off this effect, the office and camera angles would just look like sliding PNGs, so I guess this effect looks slightly better? In Kaiser's video, he mentioned that the office sprites weren't made for the perspective effect, so it just ends up looking cone-shaped. This seems like something that should have been fixed in the second game, among other things, but I guess Scott was too busy trying to get the game out as quickly as possible because the perspective effect is still present in this game, and even the later games in the series. In fact, I'm pretty sure this problem only got fixed when FNAF 6 was released three years later. For some reason in the second game, these little static lines seem to be affected by the perspective effect. You can see that as they slide down the screen, they begin to warp into a cone shape as a result of this. The camera static wasn't affected by the perspective effect in the first game, so I don't know why it occurs here. This may very well just be an aesthetic choice to make the screen look more round, kind of like those old TVs, but you can clearly see that the camera monitor is flat, so this makes no sense. I think what happened is that the static was placed on the same layer as the camera's image, which also uses the perspective effect, so the static also got affected. But it's still very strange nonetheless. Huh, that's weird. The ambient sound seems to be playing, but I don't see anyone entering the vents. Oh, oh no. Okay, I think it's time we talk about Foxy. The way Foxy works is complicated to say the least, so I won't go too deep into his mechanics. When Foxy first gets activated, he has a countdown timer that increases every second. Every second in which the flashlight is in the hallway when he's not in it, the timer goes down 0.5 seconds. But once the timer reaches a certain number, which can happen quicker depending on if his AI level is higher, he shows up in the hallway. Once in the hallway, Foxy is given a new timer for when he'll jump scare the player. This kill timer increases every second, similar to the last one. Every time the player flashes the light in the hallway, the timer will reset back to zero. If a blackout occurs from an office animatronic, Foxy's kill timer is frozen until the blackout ends. If you put the mask on when no one's in the vent blind spots or in the office, Foxy's kill timer increases at double the speed, meaning you shouldn't put the mask on unless you see an animatronic in the vent's blind spots or the office. If you don't flash for long enough, the timer will eventually run out and Foxy will be ready to jump scare you. How long you can go without flashing Foxy depends on his AI level. If his AI level is lower, you don't need to flash him that often, but if it's higher, you'll need to flash him a lot more frequently. Once Foxy's timer runs out, the next time you flash the light in the hallway or a 10 second interval passes, he'll jump scare you. If you flash him for a cumulative number of frames, which is 100 times the night number, he'll eventually leave the hallway and the cycle continues. The way I explained Foxy was kind of simplified, so if you want a more in-depth explanation, I'd suggest watching this video by the Bones 5 YouTube channel on YouTube. More specifically, the section on how Foxy works. Foxy is also why it's a bad idea to let BB into your office since he can disable your flashlight, which means Foxy's kill timer will eventually run out and at that point it's game over for you. For some reason, when Foxy or any other animatronic moves into the hallway, the flashlight stops working for a couple of seconds, instead playing this buzzing noise. This is so that the player knows when an animatronic moves into the hallway, but my question is why this happens from the game's world perspective. I mean, does the flashlight just stop working coincidentally every time an animatronic moves in the hallway? Does the player for some reason flash away from the hallway when an animatronic moves? I have no idea. Even when the flashlight stops working, for some reason you can still see a bit of the light coming from the flashlight, meaning that I guess the flashlight is still flashing in the hallway, but for some reason the light isn't actually going into the hallway. It's such a strange thing to add, and most of the time it can actually get quite annoying since the blank flashlight can stay for quite a bit of time. What if I want to check on Foxy if he's still in the hallway? Oh, I can't because someone's moving in the hallway? Oh well. Also, some animatronics can appear in the hallway and not kill you, which can be really confusing. Obviously, Foxy can kill you from the hallway, but other animatronics like Toy Chica or Mangle can appear in the hallway, but don't directly kill you from the hallway. When watching Let's Players, a lot of them put the mask on when these guys appear in the hallway, even though they can't kill you directly from the hallway. Stuff like this just adds more confusion to the game, and it can actually be harmful to the player. 
You see, if you put the mask on when there are no animatronics in the vents or office, Hawks' kill timer increases faster, and a confused player might think to put the mask on when Toy Chica and or Mangle are in the hallway since they don't know any better. So putting on the mask when seeing them in the hallway just gives you a greater chance of dying to Foxy, meaning that not only is this confusing to the player as they think the animatronic's gonna kill them even when they won't, but it also means that Foxy's more likely to kill you. The best solution to this is to just not have them appear in the hallway. Sure, we get to mess out on some cool renders like this one of Mangle in the hallway, or if you want to keep the renders, just have phone guys say something about animatronics not always attacking you from the hallway. Just something to clear up confusion. As for Night 2's gameplay, it's basically the same as the first night, just with more animatronics as mentioned earlier. The gameplay loop is pretty similar to Night 1, but since the animatronics have a higher AI level, they appear more frequently in the vent and office. Of course you have to flash Foxy now in order to prevent him from killing you, but his AI is so low on this night that he's barely an issue. As most nights go, this night also has a phone call. Phone Guy mentions the older animatronics from the parts and service as well as mentioning how to ward off Foxy with the flashlight. I don't know why he didn't mention Foxy on the first night, obviously Foxy is disabled on that night so from a gameplay standpoint it would make more sense to explain Foxy on the night that he actually appears in. But it seems pretty unwise to leave out such an important detail from the night one phone call. What if Foxy did appear on night one, then the security guard is screwed since they don't know how to fend him off. Phone Guy also mentions the puppet and reiterates to wind the music box, which got me wondering, why do we even have to wind the music box in the first place? Whose idea was it to have a music box that needs constant maintenance? Shouldn't the employees just lock the box once the day is over in order to prevent puppet from escaping or just not have this winding mechanic in the first place? It just seems like another contrived mechanic that has no logical explanation given to as to why it exists in the first place. This is a problem that carries over from the first game. The first game has a lot of unexplained mechanics, which Kaiser explained in his video, and this wasn't something that was fixed in the second game. Flashlights can go out at random times, vent animatronics can see you without your mask on and not instantly kill you, and the music box has no reason to exist other than to just use the cameras. It's all for the sake of keeping the game together. If there's no music box, you would have no reason to check the cameras, and if you have no reason to check the cameras, animatronics can never kill you. An office animatronic can't even get into your office since the blackout animation is only triggered when you pull the cameras down. Most of the game can only work if you never use your cameras, so the music box is the only thing keeping you from never dying to a vent or office animatronic. The only animatronic that could kill you if you never pulled off the cameras, and if the music box never existed, is Foxy, who's probably the only character with a decent mechanic since he actually requires you to use the flashlight and not just do nothing for most of the night. Not to mention that Foxy's AI is pretty intricate, making him the only fleshed out character whose mechanic isn't just a copy and paste of either the vent or office animatronics. Oh, look at that, night two is complete. I guess it's time to move on to night three. We're now on to night three. Uh, oh wait, there's another cutscene. Might, might as well go over that. It's basically the same as the cutscene where you first open the game, except now Bonnie and Chica are staring at you. How spooky. Similar to the first cutscene, this one starts glitching out and ends with a black screen, but this time the text says, it's me on the corner. Okay, now we're on to night three. Night three is where things get real. Or so I've heard. It introduces three new characters, those being Withered Freddy, Withered Bonnie, and Withered Chica. Regarding their designs, they're actually really cool. I love how all of them are these huge, terrifying hunks of metal, especially with their office sprites and their camera sprites. Camera sprites in which you'll probably never get to see, but that's for later. Freddy's huge and menacing stare, Bonnie's ripped off arm, face and red eyes, and Chica's unhinged jaw and scarecrow-like appearance make the wizard animatronics truly terrifying while still realistically working as animatronics kid would probably enjoy, at least if they were unwithered. As for their gameplay, each of them are very unique in their function and have no similarities at all. Yeah, no, they're exactly the same. If you know how Toy Freddy works, which I've already explained to you, pay attention. These guys basically work the exact same. You simply put the mask on as fast as possible when they enter your office, and if you don't, you're dead. This is a complaint many in the community have voiced, where despite the large cast of characters, they don't really stand out in any other way gameplay-wise, instead of being just copy and paste of one another. The main difference between them is their design, obviously, and the locations they come out of. Freddy comes from the hallway, similar to Toy Freddy, while Bonnie and Chica come from the vents. You can't actually see them in the vent blind spots when turning on the vent lights since they aren't vent animatronics, but when looked in the cameras you could see them crawling through the vents. Also, this got me thinking. The vent animatronics are kinda weird. Well, weirder than they already are. We can only assume that the vents are flimsy because, well, that's how vents are, so 
How are these massive animatronics fitting inside these vents and crawling around without them breaking them? It makes no sense. Obviously, like the other Lisa logic in this game, this is done for gameplay as another outlet for the animatronics to reach you, but it still doesn't make sense from a realistic point of view. But at this point, any realism this game might have had has been thrown out the window. On night 3, the music box is also winding down pretty fast, so it kind of becomes a pain to wind considering how much of high maintenance it is. The music box in general is kind of an issue, especially when combined with... him. Well, I think I've been stalling enough. I think now we should talk about Toy Bonnie. Oh my god, Toy Bonnie, he's gonna ruin- oh no, I'm already dead. I already know that. Okay, yeah, there's still a chance, there's still a chance. Oh no, I'm dead. In the earlier nights, Toy Bonnie is barely an issue. You see him in the vents, put the mask on, he plays his little animation, and then he leaves. No biggie, right? Well, yeah, it's not that big of a deal when the music box takes one whole minute to deplete and there are barely any threats after you. But in the later nights, where the music box only takes 15 seconds to deplete, this could become a real issue. You see, when putting on the mask, Toy Bonnie doesn't instantly start his blackout. Instead, he has a 50% chance every half second to leave, meaning with really bad luck, he could just never leave, at least for a while. And while you're waiting for Toy Bonnie to take a sweet little time getting out of the vents, the music box isn't taking its sweet little time to drain completely, meaning that if you're really unlucky, Toy Bonnie's animation can finish with you barely having any time to wind the music box, or even having the music box already running out by the time the animation is done. The worst part is that there's nothing you can really do about it. If Toy Bonnie's in the vents, flipping off the camera means you're dead most of the time, so you can't really get any extra winding time. And putting on the mask means waiting for Toy Bonnie to leave and potentially risking the music box running out. There's no winning with this guy, and he, along with Foxy, whose kill timer is pretty strict on the later nights, is the sole reason as to why the hardest mode for this game, 1020 mode, is still considered one of the hardest in the mainline FNAF series. I can tell you firsthand, Toy Bunny was one of the reasons I died a lot when trying to beat 1020, as well as me just being bad at the game in general, but that's neither here or there. Honestly, the best way to fix Toy Bonnie is to just make him leave instantly when he put the mask on. Making him leave at random times is just such a stupid idea that leads to so many unfair deaths. Funnily enough, this is actually how Toy Chica works, kinda. You see, in the game's code, Toy Chica also has a blackout animation similar to Toy Bonnie. It's just disabled in the code for some reason. This should make the gameplay even worse, since there are now two characters that have a random chance of leaving the vent, but Toy Chica actually starts her animation the moment you put the mask on, making her pretty easy. Why this wasn't the way Toy Bonnie functions is beyond me, but it would've definitely saved me from a lot of deaths. Another problem with the music box winding down quicker is that you can't look at any other cameras. On earlier nights, the music box wouldn't wind down that fast, so you could still check the cameras and see where each animatronic was going. But by night 3, the music box winds down so fast to the point where checking any other camera becomes basically pointless. I mean, you already know where the animatronics are in your office or vents without checking the cameras, so what purpose does the camera serve other than winding the music box? This is a complaint most people talk about when discussing this game, since it shows the flaws this game has when it comes to the difficulty and balanced gameplay. But at 3, you can't even check the cameras anymore to see all these cool sprites which Scott took the time to create. This is also the night where the withered animatronics are released, and some of these camera sprites are really cool, but since the music box depletes so fast, the player misses out on a chance to actually look at any of these sprites. And even if the box wasn't winding down at light speed, there's still very little point of checking the cameras, as most of the animatronics can still be seen when they're about to enter your office. Is Foxy in the hallway? Just flash him a couple times. Is there an animatronic in your vent? Just put on the mask and wait a little. Is there an animatronic in your office? Just put on the mask as fast as possible, which you should already be doing because you've probably figured that out, that you could just put the mask on and off every time you flip the camera down. What reason should I have to track the animatronics if doing that only wastes more time that can be spent flashing Foxy, checking for vent animatronics, or winding the box? Also, at this point, there are so many animatronics that it's not even worth it to keep track of them, as that's 9 total animatronics to keep track of. And even if I did want to keep track of at least one specific animatronic, I couldn't do that either because of a little thing called sprite priority. So, what is sprite priority? Well, in FNAF 1, the animatronics have this quirky little thing where if they're both in the same camera, only one of them is prioritized and shown to the player. This means that although one animatronic is visible in a certain area, there might actually be multiple, and that one animatronic simply taking priority over the others. This was a pretty huge flaw with the first game, as the whole point was to check the cameras and keep track of the animatronics. This problem was fixed in the second game, or at least Scott attempted to fix it. You see, when two animatronics are in the same area, both of them can show, but only sometimes, depending on which animatronic combination Scott decided to create a render of. 
A great example of this problem is the hallway. I can flash the hallway and see that Foxy's there, but once Toy Chica, Toy Freddy, or Withered Freddy move into the hallway, their sprites take priority over Foxy's. He's still there, and you still need to flash him, he's just not visible for some reason. Oh, but maybe Foxy's just hiding behind the other animatronics, you might say. And that's a fair assumption to make, since they do stand in relatively the same position as Foxy. But if that's the case, then the flashlight shouldn't work on Foxy. Foxy's whole mechanic of flashing the light hinges on the fact that the light disorients him, and if there's an animatronic blocking the way, then the flashlight would shine on the animatronic and not Foxy. It makes no sense why this would happen. Another thing that makes this whole situation even more confusing is that Withered Bonnie and Mangle can both appear in the hallway with Foxy, and both of them are still visible. The most likely reason for this is that, unlike the other animatronics mentioned above, Bonnie and Mangle appear more off to the side, meaning that Foxy can still be visible even when both of them are in the hallway. But if that's the case, then why doesn't this occur with Toy Freddy? You see, Toy Freddy actually has two sprites in the hallway. There's one where he's in the center of the hall, and the other one where he's off to the side. Obviously when he's in the center, you can't see Foxy since they're both in the same position, but why doesn't Foxy just show up when Toy Freddy's off to the side? Was it really that hard to just paste Foxy's model onto the already existing Toy Freddy render? Why doesn't Toy Freddy get a sprite of both him and Foxy while Bonnie and Mangle do? Did Scott just want Toy Freddy be lonely forever? Scott, do you hate Toy Freddy? Be honest. I'm not gonna go over every single example of sprite priority issues, but another big one is the main hall. The animatronics that are visible in the main hall are Mangle, Toy Chica, Withered Bonnie, Withered Freddy, and the puppet on rare occasions. Despite all five of these guys appearing in the same spot, it's only ever possible to see Mangle and Toy Chica at the same time. And yes, Mangle's lighting doesn't match at all with the rest of the room's lighting. So uh, it also turns out that Mangle can appear with uh, Withered Bonnie and Withered Freddy because, I mean, like, her image is just a PNG pasted onto the screen, so of course, right? But yeah, I am just, just wanted to point that out that Mangle can appear with all the animatronics in the hallway, but Toy Chica, Withered Freddy, and Withered Bonnie, they can't appear at the same time. It's They're mutually exclusive. And you want to know what the craziest thing about the main hall is? Every animatronic has to go through it to get into your office, and yet only five of them can be seen. Why is it they have to keep track of these animatronics and yet only five of them are visible and can actually be seen in there? Do the animatronics just drink an invisibility potion when in this room? That seems to be the only explanation. The fact that Scott attempted to fix this issue shows that he was aware that it was in the first game, but if he really wanted to fix it, why not just make sure that all of the animatronics can be seen? I would assume it's because of the amount of variation in sprites for a single room. If that's the case, he should have just taken more time to finish the game. In the literal first teaser of the game, Scott gave a release date of 2015. He had time. It's not like he was rushing to get the game out in three months. Another thing, why does the light change position whenever a new animatronic appears in a certain location? Take Party Room 2 for example. Why does the light coming from the camera change whenever Cheek is in the room? I would assume the camera light is in a fixed position and doesn't move along with the camera, but it does when Cheek is in the room for some reason? Is it a motion detecting camera that shines whenever it detects motion? It can't be that since only some camera lights have this strange quality while others don't. Also, why does your flashlight run out of batteries when you use the camera lights? I mean, it's pretty obvious by using your brain that the camera lights and the flashlights are two separate things. Unless somehow you shine the light and it goes through the camera? So does that mean that if an animatronic looks through the camera, they would see the security guard? Is there like a screen next to the camera that shows the security guard? Well, if that was the case, shining your flashlight through that screen wouldn't light up the entire room like that. And if there was a screen to show the security guard, what would be the purpose? So people in different rooms can see the security guard watching them? That sounds very nice and not at all uncomfortable. I guess Scott just wanted another reason for the flashlight to run out of battery, and I mean it's not like you're going to use the flashlight to look at the cameras in the later nights since you're too busy wanting the music box. At least unless you're using the minus 7 strat for 1020 which does utilize the other rooms. So for context, a mechanic I never explained was that most of the animatronics can actually be stalled in the cameras. If you flash a light while an animatronic is in a camera, it stalls them for a couple of seconds. Doing this strategy can stall 7 of the 10 animatronics, hence the name Minus 7. And one of these animatronics is Toy Bonnie, which basically means that getting rid of him removes RNG from the game. This strategy would be pretty easy since it's not that hard to stall all the animatronics on their own, but for some stupid reason, Balloon Boy isn't affected by this. Why not? I have no idea. It works perfectly fine for the other animatronics, so why not him? Well, I think I might have a theory for why this might be. I think Balloon Boy was added much later in development compared to the rest of the animatronics. I mean, think about it. 
Balloon Boy doesn't have any sprites, he just randomly teleports into the vent somehow. He also doesn't play the ambient sound when you're near him, probably because Scott didn't add the code that plays the sound when he gets close to you. And he doesn't get affected by the flashlight, which could also be because Scott didn't add that either. All of these things give me reasons to believe that Balloon Boy was added very late in development, probably around the time Scott was about to release the game. Which is another reason why Scott should have just taken his time with the game. Now, I should probably mention that Foxy isn't affected by the flashlight either, but that's more understandable since he's a unique animatronic and only appears on rare occasions. And also I should mention Golden Freddy doesn't get affected, but I mean, uh, I'm supposed to be saving his functionality for a later night, so yeah. I want to think about the music box as if I haven't complained about it enough, is that the wheel isn't perfectly sliced. The music box wheel is never visually shown to be exactly halfway, it's only ever slightly above halfway. Why? Why not just make it go exactly halfway? Y you know what? I, I think I'm done talking about the music box for one night. Let's just move on to the phone calls. They tried to remake Foxy, you know? Uh, they thought the first one was too scary, so they redesigned them to be more kid-friendly instead of in kid code uh, to keep the toddlers entertained, you know. But kids these days just can't keep their hands to themselves. The staff literally had to put Foxy back together at the end of every shift. Eventually, they just stopped trying and left them as some kind of take-apart, put-back-together attraction. Okay, hold up. What? Okay, first of all, whose bright idea was it to put this potentially dangerous animatronic around toddlers of all people? Toddlers are probably the worst kind of kid to put near an animatronic of all things. Wouldn't it have been a better idea to, you know, cage this new Foxy out from the other people so there's no risk if a toddler potentially getting hurt from Foxy? And it seems like things did go wrong as the kids literally pulled him apart. So what do you think is the most logical thing to do when you have children breaking apart an animatronic? Do you think A, maybe trying to fix Mangle and blocking him off from the kids in order to prevent this from happening? B, locking off Kids Cove to prevent this from happening for safety reasons? Or C, turn her into a pull-apart attraction? i say A and B would be a pretty logical decision, but C makes no sense. So can someone explain to me why they picked that option out of the myriad of good options? Wouldn't it be traumatizing for a kid to see a robot of their favorite animatronic have their limb ripped off? their body parts rearranged, or some other insane thing. The whole point of an animatronic is that they're supposed to give the illusion of actually being the character from the child's eye, but doing this just completely ruins that illusion. Not to mention how dangerous it is to let kids play around with these robotic parts. Oh yeah, let's let little Timmy play with these wires and metal parts. Surely he won't get electrocuted or potentially cut by a sharp metal piece leading to a deadly infection causing Timmy's death. Surely that's a good idea, right? Also, if Mangle is a pull-apart attraction, why doesn't his design change every night? We can only assume that Freddy's is open during the day, so surely kids are playing with her if she still ends up looking mangled at the end of the day. I understand that Scott probably didn't want to make any more sprites than he had to, but I think it would have been kind of cool to see Mangle be rearranged in these different ways each night. It's definitely not that big of a deal, all things considered, but it would have definitely been a nice little detail to include. The rest of the phone guy call is just more lore stuff about certain situation happening, but yeah, gameplay wise, I already said how the music box runs out faster and there are more animatronics now, which is basically how the rest of the game will play out. The third cutscene in the game opens the same as usual, with you from the perspective of Freddy panning over to your left and right. This time, both Bunny and Chica are staring directly at you, with their eyes obscured due to the dark light. Once you stare back at the center, you can see, Golden Freddy? The screen begins glitching, with the same It's Me text as the night before. So, uh, night four, uh, yeah, it's basically just the same as night three but harder, which I guess you could say about all the nights in the FNAF games. Since the nights are ramped up in difficulty, a lot of the animatronics are going to be close to your office throughout most of the night. And do you know what sound plays when an animatronic gets close to your office? That's right, the infamous ambience noise. I haven't really brought this noise up all too much since it's pretty bearable to listen to in the earlier nights, but by night 4, it plays constantly. Something great about the first game's atmosphere is the lack of noise. All you really hear are the fan and the occasional creepy sound. 
but these creepy sounds weren't loud or in your face, they were just playing every once in a while as a way to build up more tension. You can also hear the occasional footsteps, giving you the feeling as though something is outside of your door, slowly inching towards you. When in the kitchen, Freddy plays his music, which can be faintly heard in the office, and all of this aids in creating a creepy atmosphere. As for FNAF 2, it throws all that out the window. All you hear is noise after noise, and it's not subtle or quiet noise either. A lot of it's just in your face. You want to wind up the music box? Well, get ready to hear a lot of... Oh, what's that? There's an animatronic close by? Prepare to hear a lot of... ...playing constantly throughout the night and going insane over how much you hear it. Not to mention the constant vent noise playing. In total, six of the ten animatronics go in through the vent, meaning that all you hear is constant banging in the vents as the animatronics get into your office. Remember how I said vent animatronics have a chance of leaving the vents early? Well, the way to tell that they've left is if they've played a vent noise. However, on the later nights, you could take off the mask thinking a vent animatronic left, only for them to still be there and you have to waste more time because what you actually heard was someone else walking around in the vents. This leads to you having to wait a full 5 seconds because of how uncertain you are on whether or not the animatronics leave. If they leave early, you keep the mask on for an unnecessary amount of time, causing the music box to deplete when you could have been spending all that time winding it. And on top of that, you also cause Fox's kill timer to increase at a greater rate since that's what happens when you put the mask on when there's no vent or office animatronics. Oh yeah, the blackouts. Blackouts happen constantly. In night 3, a lot of the withered animatronics look really cool and genuinely creepy as they hover over your office with only your Freddy mask being able to fend them off. But on the later nights, these guys are just constantly in your office, causing them to lose all scariness they might have once had. Whenever you flip down the cameras, you're more likely to get a blackout than not have one. And all you do during this blackout is just wait 5 seconds doing nothing. This is the gameplay loop most average players go through. Basically it's just you flipping up the camera, winding the music box, flip the camera down, put the mask on while doing so, if there's no animatronic, just take it off, flash the hallway, check both events, put the mask on if you see anyone, rinse and repeat. This repetition was also a pretty big problem with the first game, since all you really needed to do in that game was check the doors, then the camera, then the doors, and the cameras, but yeah, it's still an issue here. The worst part is that the second game is in a unique spot where it has all these characters that can each have their own unique abilities, but instead, Scott just decides to make a majority of the cast be worded off using the mask. The most uniqueness you'll ever get out of these animatronics is where they come out from and their design. Everything else is basically the same, and combine that with the repetitive ambience that plays on and on makes for a very routine and not at all scary game. And that's the biggest problem with this game. It's not scary. At most, it's a little creepy on the earlier nights since you don't know what's coming, but by the later nights, you basically know the routine of the game and can predict pretty much any scenario that comes towards you. The most unpredictable part of this game is Foxy, and it's funny because he's the only character that actually has a decent mechanic that's not just putting on the mask. His mechanics are pretty well balanced, although his kill timer can be pretty strict at times, but he's still not impossible. And unlike some aspects of the game, his mechanics are actually explained by the phone guy. Oh yeah, that's right, the phone guy exists. Uh, just as a side note though, uh, try to avoid eye contact with any of the animatronics tonight if you can. Uh, someone may have tampered with their facial recognition systems, we're not sure. But the characters have been acting very unusual, almost aggressive towards the staff. Uh, they interact with the kids just fine, but when they encounter an adult, they just stare. Phone guy saying this implies that the animatronics weren't acting weird before. He said to try avoiding contact with them tonight. Does this mean that on the last few nights the animatronics were acting normal? Oh yeah, pizzeria animatronics walking around and crawling through vents. Totally normal stuff animatronics do, but now they're acting weird. It's possible that phone guy was just talking in the past tense, saying that they were acting weird but only now have the staff began noticing. But he words it like this is something that only started occurring on night 4, so what about the other three nights? Were they just acting quirky because? A quick fix to this would just be if he said something like, If you've been noticing anything strange over the past week, we're currently investigating that in the beginning of the paragraph in order to just make things less confusing. Honestly, I have nothing more to really say about Night 4. Let's just move on to Night 5 and get this game done with. The Night 5 cutscene is pretty much the same as the previous one except the puppet is here instead of Golden Freddy and Bonnie and Chica are facing away from us once again. Alright, night 5. It's again, just a harder version of night 4. We 
don't really need to go over the gameplay. Oh no, did I die to Foxy accidentally because I clicked on Night 6 instead of Night 5? And on Night 6, Foxy's kill timer is more strict, meaning I can die to him more easily? Oh well, I guess this is a good segue to talk about the jump scares. They're not good. So, in the first game, the jump scares were pretty in your face, and the character's lighting matched the office because the sprites were rendered with the office background. The second game, however, this doesn't happen. Instead, the sprites are transparent PNGs that are overlaid on top of the office. Now, this isn't an inherently bad thing, since now in the second game, the buttons of the doors don't just randomly disappear when the jump scare occurs, which is something that would happen in the first game due to the jump scare sprites not having the buttons on them for some reason. The disadvantage to this, however, is that the lighting and position doesn't fully match with the background. Take Foxy, for example. When he jump scares me and I'm facing directly in the hall, it looks like he's coming out of the hallway, which makes sense because that is where he's coming out of. But if I were to turn my camera to the right and then he jump scares me, it looks like he's coming out through the wall for some reason. This occurs because the sprites of the jump scares aren't centered to the office, but rather to where the player is looking which I guess was intentional, but it leads to these unintentional side effects which are kinda goofy. Besides the jump scares looking like PNGs pasted into the office, the jump scares themselves aren't all that scary. Toy Bonnie and Chica's jump scares are exactly the same with them lunging at you, which doesn't look that scary since the motion's a bit slow. Wither, Chica, and Toy Freddy also have similar jump scares with them both screaming in your face. It kinda looks like the first game, but this time it's worse because the movement's slower and less crazy looking compared to the first game. Withered Freddy's jump scare is just bad. He looks less like an animatronic trying to stuff you into a suit and more like a little kid asking if you have any apps on your phone. Withered Bonnie's jump scare is kinda cool where he looks like he's about to rip off your face, presumably to replace his missing face, but the animation is just so slow that it doesn't have the suddenness a jump scare should have. Then we have Golden Freddy, who is a character I shouldn't be talking about yet since that's a topic for Night 6, but the most I'll say about him for now is that his jump scare is bad with it just being his head careening towards you. The reason this is worse than the Golden Freddy jump scare from FNAF 1 is that, despite this one just being a still image, the way the image is positioned being right up in your face, the different jump scare noise from the default noise, as well as the suddenness of having a still image contrasted with the moving images of your office, gives you a bit of whiplash which might scare you. FNAF 2's Golden Freddy has none of that, and it just ends up looking goofy rather than scary. The only three jump scares that I think are actually scary are Foxy, the Puppet, and Mangle. The worst of these three is probably the Puppet, there's nothing inherently wrong with the jump scare, it's just that it's not as in your face as the other two. Mangle's the second scariest in my opinion since he gets right up to your face, looking like he's about to bite your frontal lobe off or something which can look pretty scary. Was that the Foxy's jump scare is the scariest for obvious reasons. His jump scare is pretty fast as it's just him launching right up to your face, mouth gaping open, so you know it's probably not going to end well for you. If I were to rank all of them from worst to best, it would probably go Golden Freddy, Freddy, Toy Freddy, Chica, Bonnie, Toy Chica, Toy Bonnie, The Puppet, Mangle, and Foxy. Something else that lessens the jump scare is the fact that most of the time, you can pretty much expect when a jump scare is going to happen. Did you put the mask on too late for an off animatronic? Well, you know you're probably going to get jump scared. Did you flip up the cameras when a van animatronic was in the blind spot? Did the music box run out because a certain blue rabbit took a sweet little time getting out of the vents? Yeah, it's game over. The only two animatronics that aren't expected are, once again, Foxy and Mangle, which is another reason why they're the only two good animatronic jump scares. Mangle works pretty much exactly the same as the other Van animatronics, with the only difference being that she camps in your office for a while and has a chance to kill you every time you pull down the cameras instead of instantly killing you. This means that failing to put the mask on for Mangle doesn't mean an instant game over, it just means that she has a chance of killing you, which can make you hesitant to pull down the cameras as you never know when she might strike, adding to some well-needed suspense to the game. The other animatronic that does this pretty well is Foxy. Since most people probably don't know how his kill timer works, they won't know whether or not they flash the hallway enough times, and Foxy could just randomly jump scare the player without them expecting it. The jump scare just comes out of nowhere, and combine that with the jump scare itself being really good, that's a pretty good jump scare, which is another reason why Foxy is one of the only good parts of the games. Anyway, on the topic of dying in this game, when you die, you get an end screen that looks noticeably worse compared to the first game. In the first game, the end screen was kind of horrifying. You just see these eyeballs popping out of the Freddy suit, clearly showing that the security guard got stuffed into the suit. The second game has none of that, with it just showing you from the perspective of the inside of a Freddy mask, with Freddy just staring at you from the outside. Instead of being horrifying, it just comes off as kind of comical, 
Like, why is Freddy looking at me like that? Alternatively, instead of getting a death screen, you instead have a random chance to get a death minigame instead. The point of these minigames is to give additional lore to the player that might not have otherwise been stated by Phone Guy. The first minigame is called Take Cake to the Children, where you take cake to the children. You play as Freddy, and whenever you see an angry kid, you have to walk over to them and give them a cake. But while this is happening, you may notice that there's a kid crying outside before a mysterious purple man comes and kills a child. As this happens, Freddy gets slower and slower, and the kids get angrier and angrier, only for the minigame to end with a puppet jump scare, implying that the kid getting killed was the puppet. In the background, you can hear a distorted voice spelling out save him, most likely referring to the child outside. The second minigame is called Foxy Go Go Go. You play as Foxy this time, starting from Pirate's Cove, and you make your way over to the children's main room. You have to repeat this multiple times, with the second and third time showing one kid on the bottom clearly unhappy. On the fourth time, the same mysterious purple man as in the previous minigame appears on the corner of the room. When you enter the main room, you're met with those five kids, dead. The game ends with a foxy jump scare. The third minigame is called Follow Me, where you follow the puppet while playing as Freddy. This time, the distorted voice in the background spells out Save Them, which refers to the kids that have been killed. As you walk around, you can see the bodies of five kids lying down in separate rooms. The puppet leads you to a giant gift box with a dead body next to it. Unlike the other games which end with a jump scare, this one just ends randomly. The final minigame is called Give Gifts, Give Life. You play as the puppet, giving gifts to four dead kids. A voice in the background can be heard spelling out help them, referring to the kids who you're giving life to. Once the gifts are placed, you give them each ahead of the respective FNAF 1 animatronics. Once this is completed, a fifth child appears in the center of the screen for a split second, which is then followed by a Golden Freddy jump scare. That fifth kid obviously being Golden Freddy. I'm sure all those FNAF theorists out there can solve the lore in this one, but I can't, so I'm not. All I know is that this is a pretty ingenious way of giving out information that might not have otherwise been given. Eases arcade games, something that fits well into the whole arcade pizzeria theme, and he uses it to give more lore hints and help the community piece together the lore. I don't really see an issue with it, other than that it can get kind of annoying when replaying the games, especially if you're playing the later nights or 1020 where you die a lot but it's still a great addition to the game for all the story it gives out. Speaking of lore hints, when beating Night 5, you get confirmation that FNAF 2 takes place in 1987, the same year as The Bite, as well as the fact that the security guard's name is Jeremy Fitzgerald, so that's pretty cool, I guess. There's not really much more to say regarding Night 5, not that this section had anything to do with Night 5, really. I really just used the whole Nights thing as a way to divide the videos into separate sections with the topics I discussed vaguely relating to what's in the night. Oh well, on to Night 6. Haha, uh -huh, a game called Five Nights at Freddy's has six nights. So, just like the first game, FNAF 2 has a bonus six night you can play for a harder challenge. The only notable thing about this night is that it's the only night where Golden Freddy actually has a chance to spawn that isn't one in a hundred or one in a thousand. So, on nights two and three, Golden Freddy only has a one in a thousand chance of spawning, meaning that although it's possible, it's extremely rare for him to spawn on any of these nights. This chance is increased on nights four to five as he now has a one in a hundred chance, which is still pretty rare, but not as rare as on nights 2 to 3. Night 6 is the only night where he really has a good chance of spawning, having a 1 in 10 chance, so I guess we'll discuss him here. When active, Golden Freddy has a chance to appear in your office when you ever pulled the cameras down. If this happens, you have to put the mask on to ward him off. How original. The difference here being that instead of waiting 5 seconds for him to leave, you could just take the mask off immediately, which most players already do when pulling down the cameras. If you don't put the mask on, Golden Freddy will jump scare you either if you flash the hallway or put the cameras back up. That's not all Golden Freddy does, as when there are no animatronics in the hallway, his head has a chance to appear in there for some reason. Yeah, it looks kind of goofy if I'm being honest. If you flash the hallway for a cumulative 1.6 seconds, he'll jump scare you, but if you don't flash him for a while, or another animatronics appears in the hallway, he'll go away. Golden Freddy's mechanics aren't really explained here, but honestly, they don't really need to be. At this point, the whole putting the mask on after flipping the cameras down becomes second nature, and the player should hopefully be able to realize that flashing the hallway for too long will cause Golden Freddy to kill you. Not to mention that it would be a little weird for Phone Guy to explain this since Golden Freddy is kind of a mysterious ghostly figure. It's a little vague on whether or not he's a ghost or an actual animatronic. I mean, he appears in your office, and the mask flashlight clearly affects him in some way but when putting the mask on, he sort of just fades away like a ghost would. Also, his head appears in the hallway, which wouldn't be possible if he was just a regular animatronic. Honestly, I have no idea. FNAF lore has never been straightforward, 
Also, sometimes Golden Freddy has a rare chance of appearing in your office in the hallway at the same time, which just adds more confusion. Now, Golden Freddy in the first game was more of an easter egg, only having a 1 in 32,000 chance of appearing in your office. Compare this to the second game, where he actually has an AI value similar to the other animatronics, and can appear quite frequently in your office or hallway. This kind of makes his easter egg status a little less special, since he's treated more like a part of the main cast rather than just as a secret character that appears very rarely. Although, I guess this game makes up for it by having a total of 5 other easter egg characters. Yes, you heard me, 5 other characters. The first two are pretty notable, being Shadow Freddy and Shadow Bonnie. Shadow Bonnie has an extremely rare chance of appearing in your office if you flip down the cameras, and crashes your game if you look at him for too long. He's basically just Toy Bonnie but painted completely black with white glowing eyes and teeth, and in the office he just looks like a PNG poorly pasted into the already existing office sprite. Also, while recording this footage, I managed to encounter Shadow Bonnie for myself, which was a shock to me since he only has a 1 in 16,000 chance of showing up. For some reason, for me, when I encountered him, instead of crashing my game, he just took me back to the main menu. I think the reason for this is because I opened OBS right as this happened, so the game got confused and just took me back there. But I'm glad I got it on video. Dude, did I just get a Shadow Bonnie? <laughs> Dude, you're, you're kidding, you're kidding. Okay, okay, I'm glad I recorded that, I'm glad I recorded that. The next character is Shadow Freddy, who has a chance of appearing in the parts and service room, given that all the other withered animatronics have already left the room. His design is much better compared to Shadow Bonnie, with him being a purple version of Golden Freddy with glowing white eyes. The third character is this empty endoskeleton who can appear in the prize corner after the puppet left, or in this left vent. He can actually block other animatronics from entering the vent, making him kinda useful. I actually encountered the empty endoskeleton in the prize corner once while trying to beat 1020, which is pretty cool. The fourth character is JJ, which is just a recolored version of Balloon Boy, who can appear at the bottom of your desk. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if I encountered JJ, considering how unnoticeable she is. The fifth and final easter egg character is the Paper Pal. These guys are by default in the party room, but there's a chance that one of them can appear in your office. The funny thing is that if you see them in your office and then go to the party room camera, you can see that one of them is missing, implying that there's some sort of ghostly ability foot. I actually had this happen to me on the mobile version, but I couldn't record the footage because I had guided access turned on. If you don't know what guided access is, it basically just locks you from using your home screen or going to control center, which is what you need to screen record something. The reason I had this turned on is because of Apple's stupid decision to put this little notch on the bottom of the screen, which was interfering with my pressing of the camera and mask button, and turning on guided access removes that notch. But yeah, you're just gonna have to take my word when I tell you that I had a paper pal in my office. Also, my brother saw me encounter it, and my brother would never lie about anything, so, yeah. Anyway, let's talk about the Night 6 phone call. Oh, hello! Uh, what on earth are you doing there? Uh, didn't you get the memo? Uh, the place is closed down, at least for a while. I also love how Phone Guy just says hello, hello before his phone call, despite seeming like he wanted to get straight to the point. It makes me wonder if Phone Guy is obligated to say that before every phone call, or else he'll get killed by upper management or something. Although, to be fair, this is fast brand entertainment. They probably are responsible for multiple deaths, so is this really out of the question? We have one more event scheduled for tomorrow, a birthday. You'll be on day shift. Wear your uniform. Stay close to the animatronics and make sure they don't hurt anyone, okay? Hmm, I wonder what sort of incident will happen to the night guard once he takes the day shift. Perhaps some kind of bite of Was some sort? The bite of 87? Can you tell I'm running out of things to say? Alright, well, when Beating Night 6, you're shown this end screen saying that the toy animatronics are being scrapped and that they're bringing the old animatronics back in the future, obviously you're referring to FNAF 1. Oh well, at least Night 6 is finished, meaning I don't have to play any more of this- There's a custom night, of course there is. So, just like FNAF 1, FNAF 2 has a custom night in it where you can customize the character's AI levels to your heart's content. This is a pretty neat reward for being Night 6, as Night 6 is pretty difficult, but not as difficult as the other challenges in this custom night as we'll soon see. Clicking on the custom night button brings you to this menu with 10 animatronics on the roster, which include Withered Freddy, Withered Bonnie, Withered Chico, Withered Foxy, Balloon Boy, Toy Freddy, Toy Bonnie, Toy Chica, Mangle, and Golden Freddy. Now, I assume that you know how the FNAF AI works, but the basic gist is that the AI level determines the chance out of 20 in which an animatronic can move every 5 seconds. The only characters that don't follow this are Foxy, Golden Freddy, and the puppet as explained earlier. Also, the puppet isn't on this menu for some reason. Yeah, despite this being called a custom night, the puppet, one of the biggest threats you have to deal with is missing from this menu. I feel like the reason for this might have been because Scott wanted an even 10 animatronics and 
there's no really good way to make this menu with 11 animatronics without it feeling off. Now, something I haven't mentioned yet is that the puppet's AI is actually completely separate from the music box speed. The music box is its own little thing while the puppet's AI is dedicated to how fast he'll go after the music box runs out. It would be a little weird to have two separate AI levels for both the music box and the puppet itself, so my solution is to just make the puppet's AI in this menu dedicated to the music box's speed rather than how fast the puppet gets to your office after the box runs out. I'd also make it so that at zero AI, the box doesn't decrease at all, but as the number increases, the speed would get faster. Since by default, the customized box depletes fully after 15 seconds, at the max puppet AI, the music box would deplete at the same rate. Another strange thing about the custom knight is that even when Foxy's AI is set to zero, he could still appear in the hallway and even kill you. This is because Foxy's kill timer works differently from the rest of the animatronics, meaning that setting his AI to zero just means that his kill timer will take longer to run out. But if Foxy can't truly be disabled on the custom knight, why doesn't he show up on night one? Well, this is because his kill timer is completely turned off rather than his AI being set to zero. This means that his kill timer never increases and thus he can never get into the hallway. The way I would fix this issue is by just making it so that setting Foxy's AI to zero would automatically disable him. It's a bit misleading that Foxy shows up even when his AI is set to zero, so doing what I propose would just make more sense. I mean, what if someone wanted to play the Custom Knight without Foxy or the Puppet? It's a bit flawed considering that the name Custom Knight would have you believe that you could disable or enable all the animatronics, even though it doesn't work on Foxy or the Puppet. Another thing that's a little sneaky is that when setting the animatronics AI to 20, it doesn't actually set it to 20. This is because the AIs are actually capped at different AI levels depending on the animatronic. A majority of the animatronics are capped at 15 while Foxy is capped at 17 and Golden Freddy is capped at 10. The reason for this is because the capped version is actually harder compared to if the animatronics were actually set to 20 AI. This is because if the animatronics were set to 20 AI, that would guarantee that a blackout would start every time you flip down the cameras, which can actually be a good thing in most cases. So these capped AI levels actually make the game harder rather than easier. Also, when Foxy's AI is actually set to 20 and not just his capped AI, he can sometimes have a 1 second kill timer, which means you need to flash him every second, which seems a little unfair, so it's probably for the best that he's capped at 17. Something else about the custom night menu is that there's no visible way to exit the menu. You could use the F2 button on your keyboard, which brings you back to the main menu, but this isn't ever communicated to you in the game, so no one would know this unless they looked it up. I will give credit where credit's due, however. This custom night menu is a pretty big improvement over the FNAF 1's custom night menu. In the first game, you could actually click and hold to fast forward each animatronic's AI level, which meant that you had to spam click the button each time you wanted to play 420. This, however, has been fixed in FNAF 2 as now you can just click and hold to quickly switch between the AI levels. On the bottom of the screen, you can also scroll through the different custom night presets with each different animatronic at different AI levels. This is a neat way to give players extra content once they finish night 6, and it's much better compared to how bare bones the FNAF 1 screen looked. Completing these custom night presets will show a little star next to the title of each preset, which is a nice way to keep track of which preset you've completed and which ones you haven't. Another cool thing is that completing each preset will give you a different decoration on your desk. From plushies to figures and other things of that sort that give you more of an incentive to complete these challenges as they act as a nice trophy for them. The first custom night preset is 2020-2020 mode, or just 420 for short. It basically mirrors the first game in that it's the four main animatronics at their max AI level. Since none of the animatronics active appear in your vents, you really only need to wind the music box, flash Foxy, and put the mask on to ward off any animatronics that in your office. The hardest part about this challenge is probably Foxy since his AI is at the max here, so you'll have to flash him constantly. But the office animatronics blackouts pause Foxy's timer, so this shouldn't really be much of an issue. This is also the custom night preset that gives you a third star on the menu. In the first game, you'd get three total stars for completing different parts of the game. One for completing the main game, one for completing the sixth night, and a third for completing 420 mode. And it works basically the same here. I think stars are another cool little trophy. 420 is the only preset that doesn't give a plushie on the desk, so the third star just makes up for it. However, I feel like it would be more appropriate to give the third star for completing 1020 mode since it's way harder than 420. In fact, I'd say that this game's 420 is pretty on par with FNAF 1's 420, which is pretty easy to complete nowadays. The second custom night preset is new and shiny, which has all the toy animatronics, Mangle, and Balloon Boy set to 10 AI. Really enough, this challenge is actually harder than 420. Despite the animatronics being set at 10, most of them work differently from one another. 
Obviously, Toy Chica, Mangolin, Balloon Boy are Van animatronics, which are much harder to deal with compared to the office animatronics since you can't easily tell when they've left. Another factor contributing to the difficulty is Toy Bonnie. He isn't that hard to deal with in this preset since his AI is still set to 10, meaning he doesn't show up that much in the events. But since the music box winds down really fast on custom nights, it can be a bit of a risk once Toy Bonnie shows up. Sometimes he just decides not to leave the vents, which can completely ruin a run if you're low on music box winding. Toy Freddy's also here, but he's barely an issue just working like the rest of the office animatronics. And of course, Foxy's here as well, despite his AI being set to zero. This is probably for the best, honestly, because if he wasn't there, Balloon Boy wouldn't be as big of an issue. Despite the slight increase in difficulty, New and Shiny is still a cakewalk. You might die once or twice from a bad Toy Bonnie RNG or just taking off the mask despite a Ben animatronic still being in the vent, but it's still really easy. Also beating it gives you this little Toy Bonnie figure, which is good for me since I can let out all my anger onto this little thing after dying due to Toy Bonnie's antics. The third custom night preset is Double Trouble, featuring both the Bonnies at 20 AI and Foxy at 5 AI. Yeah, this preset is really easy. Despite featuring him on the roster, Toy Bonnie's barely an issue since you really get so much time winding the music box due to the lack of activity happening. Foxy's frankly not that big of an issue, his AI is only at 5, meaning that if you flash him every once in a while, you should be golden. Withered Bonnie will probably show up every once in a while, but it's not to the point where your music box will deplete fully, and the same goes for Toy Bonnie. So yeah, this knight is definitely easier than you and Shiny. Despite the two Bonnies being at 20 AI, there's nothing else in the way to really ruin this run. Also, beating it rewards you with a Bonnie plushie, so that's cool. The next challenge is Knight of Misfits, with BB, Mangle, and Golden Freddy at 20 AI. And Foxy's there too, of course. Again, this challenge is really easy. You don't even need to check the right vent since Mangle makes a static noise whenever he's in the vents. Golden Freddy's also pretty easy to deal with. If he's in your office, you just put the mask on and off, which you should already be doing as a habit every time you pull the cameras down. He also just flashes light sparingly to avoid Golden Freddy's jump scare in the hall. Remember that he can only get you if you flashed him for a long time. And if you see Foxy in the hallway, just flash him every once in a while when he's in the hallway. Since his AI is so low, you don't even need to worry about spamming the flashlight to prevent his jump scare. BB and Mangle may be a little problematic, I mean, both are Ven animatronics, which are harder than Off's animatronics, but they can still be pretty easily warded off while still keeping the music box intact. Once completed, you get rewarded with this Balloon Boy bobblehead, which does look kinda cute compared to the actual Balloon Boy who I want to punt. Foxy Foxy is the next preset, and actually provides a bit of a challenge. It's easier than 420 obviously, only having Foxy and Mangle, but Foxy at 20AI combined with Mangle who's a Ven animatronics makes for a bit of a stressful night. Unlike the office animatronics, Van animatronics don't actually freeze Foxy's AI counter, and combine this with Foxy's stricter time means you'll have to flash Foxy a lot more often, especially when Mangle shows up in the vent. This isn't too hard, but having to deal with Foxy, Mangle, and the music box makes this night 10 times more stressful. Foxy's the only animatronic that still genuinely scares me when playing FNAF 2. When his AI sets something like 1 or 2, he's no big deal, but once his AI is around 15 and above, that's when things start to get real since his timer is so strict, making him the only character that keeps me on edge in later nights. Anyway, once you complete this preset, you're given a Foxy plush, which seems pretty expected to be honest. The next preset is Ladies Night, featuring Wither Chica, Toy Chica, and Mangle all at 20, as well as Foxy too. All you really need to do is check the left vent in case Toy Chica shows up and put the mask on when Wither Chica enters your vent. Since Mangle makes the radio noise, there's no point in checking the right vent since you'll already hear when he's in there. This is again a really easy challenge. The biggest problem you're gonna probably deal with is the music box since now there's two vent animatronics to deal with plus an ops animatronic, but it's still very easy to keep the box wound up. This is a pretty easy challenge and it rewards you with a Chica plushie on your desk. Not much more else to really say. The next preset is Freddy's Circus, which is around the same difficulty as New and Shiny in my opinion. It features the two Freddies at 20 AI and Foxy, Balloon Boy, and Golden Freddy at 10 AI. This is again really easy with you only needing to check the left vent for BB and putting on the mask for the three Freddies. Foxy's AI is a bit higher here, but flashing the light frequently makes him not that big of an issue. Again, it's a pretty easy challenge that rewards you with a Freddy plush for completing it. Now it's time for the big three. These are the last three custom night challenges that feature all 10 animatronics with their AI set to different values. On Cupcake Challenge, they're all set to 5, on Fazbear Fever, they're set to 10, and on Golden Freddy Mode, they're set to 20. The Cupcake Challenge is pretty easy, the animatronic AIs are pretty low, and the hardest part is probably keeping up the music box, which is pretty tricky since there are a lot of animatronics getting to you, but it's still nothing too unbeatable. When completed, the Cupcake Challenge rewards you with Chica's cupcake on your desk staring at you very creepily. 
Fazbear Fever is where things start to get real. Now the animatronics are set to 10, meaning that they'll show up more frequently and Foxy's kill timer is also a bit more strict, so you'll have to flash them more often. And the music box is harder to maintain since the animatronics are coming at you more frequently. If you're very familiar with FNAF 2 and its mechanics like I am, this is a pretty easy preset, but for first time players it can be a bit of a challenge. Beating it rewards you with Freddy's microphone, which I guess you just stole from him. Which is a bit mean of you to do if you ask me. Finally we have Golden Freddy, also known as 1020 mode. This is a pretty infamous challenge in the FNAF community, mainly due to Toy Bonnie and Foxy. Foxy's kill timer here is really strict, and combine that with you need to wind the music box, plus the offset vent animatronics you need to deal with gives you a recipe for disaster. Another issue is of course, Toy Bonnie. Toy Bonnie can appear in your vents, and sometimes it feels like no matter how long you keep the mask on, he just never leaves to start his blackout. I've already explained in depth why he's a menace earlier, so just forward back to that part if you forgot. This mode has a pretty deep history, with people finding different strategies and even managing to remove Toy Bonnie from the equation altogether through the minus 7 strategy I mentioned earlier. I'll link a video to the strategy in the description as well as any other footage or videos I might have mentioned. Let me tell you firsthand, this challenge was not easy. If I didn't put the mask in time for the off animatronic, dead. If we didn't flash Foxy for a second long enough, dead. If Toy Bonnie was in my vent, dead. Safe to say, this night was really hard. And the strategy I used to aid me was the timer strategy by Shooter25, which basically involves you using a timer to time when to flip the cameras, flash Foxy, and put the mask on or off. It helped quite a bit, but since Toy Bonnie still existed, it took me way longer than it should have. When beating 1020, you're rewarded with a Golden Freddy plush on your desk. And now whenever someone sees that plush on your desk when playing FNAF 2, they'll know you wasted your life trying to beat the scary bear game. Or that you used a cheat code to skip the night which exists for some reason. Or that you edited the save file which shows that you had 1020 complete even if you didn't. I think it's safe to say that 1020 is probably one of the most iconic, hardest nights in any FNAF game. Due to it being the first of its kind that provides a great challenge that's still really difficult to play to this day. It's been able to birth a new community of people still trying to find out more information about the game and create new strategies around it. It's only a matter of time before the FNAF community finds more secrets hiding within the code of this game. But yeah, I personally love the fact that this game has custom night presets. Despite a lot of them being really easy, it doesn't make them any less fun to play, and I still enjoy playing them and trying to beat them. Also, after finishing a custom night, there's a screen that says you're fired, as well as the name Fritz Smith instead of Jeremy Fitzgerald, who we played as on the earlier nights. I like to imagine that Fritz wasn't actually hired by Fazbear Entertainment, but rather he was just some random guy that walked into the pizzeria and somehow managed to fend off all these guys with their max AI level. But hey, the custom nights on this game are actually pretty enjoyable, and with that out of the way, I've pretty much covered every aspect I wanted to talk about. There's not really that much else I need to- wait. Is that FNAF on mobile? Okay, well, uh, I guess I should talk about that too. FNAF 2, just like FNAF 1, was ported onto mobile and console. Now, I don't have the console version, nor do I want to spend money on the console version, so I might as well just talk about the mobile version since I already have that. The first thing that you might notice is that the mobile version has different menu music. The menu music on the PC version was taken from a stock music library, similar to the first game. So to avoid copyright issues, Scott just got his go-to FNAF music composer Leon Riskin to compose a new music theme. It does have a very similar sound to the PC version's menu theme, but I think the PC version is a little more creepy sounding, which is strange because the PC version wasn't even meant to be scary, being made for what appears to be an adventure game of some sorts. Well, the mobile version was meant to be scary. Another change is that there's now a shop and options menu. Kaiser already went over these in his FNAF mobile video, and these options aren't any different in the second game, just including subtitles, visual options, well, the shop has cheats. The most notable thing I want to bring up is the display mode, which allows you to change the game from either 4x3 or full screen. The reason I wanted to bring this up is because the full screen option stretches your screen, similar to the PC version. The thing is, the stretch version looks pretty terrible on most modern phones. The game already looks bad when stretched to 16x9, so on a modern phone, which most likely has a screen wider than 16x9, it looks much worse. Seriously, who in their right minds would play like this? At least they gave you an option to play in a 4x3 ratio as God intended. I mean, I just realized that this is the second time I'm ranting about aspect ratios of a scary bear game. What am I doing with my life? Anyway, the gameplay isn't that different at all. The main thing you might notice is this button on the screen to flash your flashlight, which can be slightly annoying, but it's nothing too unbearable. But something else noticeable is that the poster on the wall is different from the one on the PC version. 
This is because Toy Bonnie's guitar had some copyright issues with a guitar company copywriting the design. It's honestly such a stupid and insignificant thing for a guitar company to get riled up over. Just why? Alongside the poster, Toy Bonnie's model in the party room also had to be changed. He used to just stand there holding the guitar, but now he just stands there awkwardly. Couldn't they just replace the old guitar with a new one? He looks so awkward here. The newspaper screen when first starting the game is also different since the original had Bonnie's original guitar. The image just looks like it was pasted onto the already existing image and it looks pretty bad here. Also, the screen for Beating Night 5 and the Custom Night was changed for the same reason of Bonnie's guitar. The PC version used more muted colors making the check stand out more which is absent on the mobile version which makes the end screen look way too busy. The strange thing is, the Night 6 screen wasn't changed since the check on that screen covers Bonnie's guitar, meaning that the newspaper screen on Night 1 is inconsistent with the one on Night 6. Those are the only notable changes I can think of. Some, some of the intervals for the animatronics were also changed, but that really only affects you if you're using the timer strategy for 1020, so it's not that big of a deal. Unless you want to beat 1020 on mobile, then it kind of is. Another thing is that the custom night menu actually got a couple of improvements. Now you can automatically change the animatronics AI to 0 or 20 if you want. And there's now a back button. But yeah, FNAF 2 on mobile. It's just like the game on PC, but on mobile instead. I'm sure the console version comes with most of the changes the mobile version has, just with console controls. Also, there was an older version of the mobile FNAF 2, similar to FNAF 1, and the rest of the games in the series. It was pretty bad, and I have no idea what happened to cause it to look this bad, but hey, it's funny to look at, so I guess that's a plus. Despite all the complaints I had about FNAF 2, I love this game, and it's not just because of the community and the influence this game had on it, although that definitely contributes to that, but it's the game itself and its attempts to be better than FNAF 1. Even if the game was rushed, the fact that this game in the state it is in currently was only made in 3 months is still pretty impressive. Ska had to make 3 models of each animatronics and locations and he had to program several different functionalities for how each aspect of the game would work, even if a lot of them are flawed. I personally find this game much more enjoyable compared to the first due to its replayability and extra challenges placed in at the end, and the intensity of the later nights in 1020 with tight timings and Foxy's music box makes this game very chaotic in a good way and it gives me a lot of panic, which I enjoy honestly. Seriously, Foxy still keeps me on edge when playing this game since I never know when he might get me, and the other animatronics help with that as it gives me less time to flash the light, making him more worried as to whether or not he'll get me. This was also my first exposure to FNAF as I first heard of the game when I watched Dante DM play this game. Okay, so my first exposure was actually in playing this FNAF 2 Minecraft remake. Okay, wait, why does it look like that? Um, anyway, but yeah, he made other videos about FNAF 2 and I watched those too, so yeah. If I hadn't seen that video, I probably wouldn't have liked FNAF, at least not when I was 9. I probably would have still gotten into the series, but it probably wouldn't have happened when I was so young. I also remember this one time when my brother and I did this band recital and I played the guitar and my brother played the drums. Both of us played the FNAF 1 song by The Living Tombstone, truly the peak of my music career. But none of that would have happened if it weren't for FNAF 2. So yeah, is this game flawed? Absolutely. It's a rushed game that I think would have definitely been better had Scott taken his time to flesh out more of the mechanics. But in its current state, with chaotic later nights and quick on your feet gameplay, I think it's still very enjoyable, and I appreciate the game for what it brings to the table, rather than what it misses on.